In a filthy world, some clean-up jobs are bigger and dirtier than the rest. These are the people whose job it is to deal with the biggest and dirtiest of them all. In supersized grime. This time on Supersize Grime, danger for the men cleaning central London's tallest block of flats. Um, we're going to take the cradle in now. It's um, just got two windows. A giant ship covered in grime, and just two days to get it clean. People will just think that it's just a basic everyday job, like washing a car. As you can see, it's not, you know what I mean? In Gloucester, say. <laughs> The tiny house that hides a supersized pile of filth. Oh my god. That goes on. And on. Oh my god. And on. I don't know if people live in it. Oh dear. And pigeons have been using this Birmingham toilet as, well, a toilet. After 20 years, the guano makes you gag. Kind of hits you in the face. But first. Beneath the waters of the River Mersey lurks a supersized grime problem. This is the P&O ferry Norbank, continually running the Liverpool to Dublin route. The Norbank's 167 metre long hull has been underwater for two and a half years. Unseen, a crust of marine growth has built up. Today, they're going to clean nearly 7,000 square metres of hull. That means getting the Norbank out of the water. So it's into one of Europe's biggest dry docks at the Camel Laird shipyard on Merseyside. Getting 17,000 tonnes of ship perfectly lined up is Graham. I direct the lads which way they've got to go. Left port, starboard, and that's basically it. Like, But this is like critical part of it. It's got to be spot on. They're going to drain the dock. Under the water is a set of wooden blocks already in place to support the ship. Graham's job is to make sure it's in exactly the right place. If it misses the blocks, the hull could be severely damaged. What happens if you get it wrong? Yeah, I'll have to go to Price Street and sign on. <laughs> Graham lines the ship up by eye. The team use ropes to pull the huge ferry into place. We've still got to adjust, like I have to keep telling the lads port and starboard. Because it's quite windy today, it, it moves, so I keep telling them which way to pull it. So at the moment, we're dead centre, so everything's good at the moment. In the control room, they're getting ready to pump the water out. We've got, like, two main main pumps, which are capable of pumping 78,000 gallons a minute. That's two, each pump does that. The dock capacity itself holds something like, when it's full, 36 million gallons of water. Uh, we're looking at uh, three hours today for the pump down. Basically now we've just got the ship bang in position. Just going to lock the, uh, the fan on. Fan on! With the giant dock gates closed, the dock is pumped down. Finally, the Norbank's hull sees the light of day for the first time in two and a half years. As expected, it's covered in a grungy crust of barnacles, mussels and assorted marine life. It has to come off. But for the moment, they can't do anything about it. The Norbank can't be cleaned because it's sitting on nearly two acres of mud. It's silt from the Mersey that's flooded in when they last filled the dock. Before they clean the ship, they've got to clean the dock. At the other end of the country, in the city of Gloucester, is a filthy structure that at first sight is a little less impressive than a huge ship. But behind the door of this ordinary looking three bedroom house lurks a supersized problem that will shock hardened cleaning professionals Danny, Morris, and James. Danny heads inside first. He has no idea what he'll find. Uh, the next kid asked me to clear this place out because the poor chap died. Say. Incredibly, someone was living here with the house in this state. 
There's a lot of stuff here. I have a lot of stuff here. Videos, monitors. In amongst the household junk is a lot of expensive electronics. I think we're going to be here for a few days, I think. This room here is full right up as well. I don't know how people live in it, but you never know what's next door to you. This is quite nice, isn't it? Oh, it's turning out to be a worse job than I thought. That's nice and clean on there. Uh, Some of the food packets seem quite recent. I don't know where he cooked his meals. There's some rats and that thing down there. Right down there, doesn't it? Oh, and now it just gets worse. They have a job walking around here and all. Just full of monitors and, and bloody computer stuff. It's bloody everywhere. No, I must say, this might be the worst, worst one we've done this. That camera's probably better than the one you got, but never mind. Just, oh, dear. There you go, Neil Diamond, Sweet Caroline. Because my wife's name's Caroline, and uh, I don't call her sweet, though. <laughs> All right, boys. There's, there's a bloody lot of stuff in there. I'm not, you know, so there's a bit of overtime for you tonight. Good. <laughs> suited and booted? Yeah, let's get suited Let's up. go. Coming up on Super Size Grime. Oh, my God. The Gloucester job gets bigger and more disgusting. Stinks. The giant tower that puts the wind up a window cleaner. Can you try and get these turbines turned off? And the Birmingham public toilet filled with excrement that's a super size health hazard. It's at least two to three inches of pure pigeon mess here. We're following the teams with the biggest and dirtiest jobs in the land. Coming up, on Merseyside, acres of mud are stopping the cleaning team getting to the hull of the Norbank. But first, a blustery day in London's Elephant and Castle, and a whole lot of glass needs cleaning. This is the record-breaking Strata, London's tallest residential building, sometimes called the Razor. It's famous for the wind turbines on top, and its very big windows. It's over an acre of glass, and it badly needs a clean. Tackling the grime, Billy, Paul, and Peter. Plus some specialist equipment. Bucket, check. Squeegee, check. Safety harness, check. Cradle attached to 80-foot telescopic arm, check. And you'd better take a good head for heights. And because this building, um, the cradle isn't fixed to the building, you're floating about, well, hanging on, suspended on wires. Uh, the wind can take you and bash you into the building, causing damage to the building and to the cradle. We call it a boat, because it, it moves about a bit. Just got to make sure the cables are not tangled up around the cradle. This is what's known as a, a fall arrest harness. So if I, do, if I do come out of the cradle, which has never happened before, it's like a, like a shock absorber on the back, and that will take some of the um, some of the loading as I fall down. And with that comforting thought, Paul fills his bucket. His big concern is the wind. We can work in snow, uh, rain, uh, sun, whatever. The, the wind dictates whether you can work or not. It's a bit windy today. Um, the only thing we can do is uh, take it out and see how we feel. You can't really tell until you're actually over the edge. That's because the building itself can shield you from the wind. Even on a day like today, some faces of the building may be safe. OK. If, if it's too windy, I'll take it straight back in. I think you're up against it, but... Well, I'll give it a go. You're a brave man. Now I have to... I have to move the, the top... the top slewing arm. Because of the way the roof's designed, the only way to reach the far side is to lift the cradle right over the top. What we're doing now is we're raising the arm up. As the cradle's lifted into the wind, it begins to sway. We're going to go up so we're over the, up, up above the building, and then we're going to slew round into the position where we're working. 
We're supposed to be about 44 stories now. Conditions are getting worse. If Paul's frightened, he's not showing it. The, tall, the taller you go up a building, the, the higher the wind is. That's when you start really noticing it, when you're going over the turbines. Strata's turbines generate enough electricity to power the common parts of the building. Yeah, we'll trying to get these turbines turned up. But today, they seem to be causing extra turbulence. So it's a bit of a wind factor today, so it's just going down to make sure they're all switched off for a safety factor, obviously. I think it's picking up. Um, I'm going to take it up to the full height. The cradle's reached its maximum height, just over 500 feet above street level. I'm going to give it five, five more minutes, but um, the way I feel at the moment is it's probably too windy to carry on. That's our worst enemy, the wind. The danger is the, the cradle would, would twist around around the wires. Um, and then you've got the, the danger of the, the cradle actually hitting the building. Hello, mate. Um, we're going to take the cradle in now. It's um, just got too windy. The quest for sparkling windows is over. For now. We've had a go. It proved to be too windy. And uh, you know, we'll have a go another day. Can't, can't fight nature. But up in Birmingham, nature is fighting back. One of the heroes keeping England's second city clean is filth inspector Brendan. Today, he's been called to a public toilet that's been abandoned for 20 years and has turned into a supersized risk to public health. Apparently, there's been pigeons in here for the last 20 years. Pigeons? Surely a few flying rats can't cause that much damage. Obviously, while I'm in there today, I'll be doing a spray, a biocide spray, which will kill any bacteria. The toilet is going to be knocked down, but the demolition crew can't go in because of the infection risk from this much guano. Blooming heck. Dear now. This is, ba this is bad. Whew. Guano? Droppings? Feces? Or poo? Call it what you like. This is 20 years' worth. It's three inches deep on the floor to nine inches or more in the basins and toilets. You see the birds in here? If you roost on the edge, and again, the toilet, and you can, you can see how much it's filled up there. Little baby chicks just here. Obviously, you can smell that. They smell the stink in here, and obviously, the, I mean, it's coming through the mask. I mean, it's the smell of ammonia. Poo is mixed with pigeon corpses and maggots and is a real health hazard. It's, it's awful. It really is bad. It's quite soft on your feet to touch, and obviously you can imagine it's at least two to three inches of pure pigeon mess here. Um, obviously, over the years, it's just built up and built up. This used to be a sink. It's going there is in a tap of some, some sort. It's just horrendous. I mean, the next job is now to do a biocide spray of all the pigeon feces to kill any bacteria, pathogens. The biocide spray will kill bugs in fresh droppings on the surface, giving at least some protection to the cleaning team. <laughs> this is probably the, no the nice bit of the job, is just giving it a good spray before the guys come in, but uh, I really don't envy them at all. It's nasty and dangerous, and every trace of pigeon faeces has to go. At least a ton of pigeon mess in there, obviously 20 years worth, and um, the only trouble is now we've only got two days to do it. On Merseyside, the PO Ferry Norbank is out of the water for the first time in two and a half years. It's not a pretty sight. The huge hull is encrusted with marine life. Seawater inlets are a seething mass of mussels. It's got to be totally cleaned and refitted in just a few days, then back onto the Liverpool-Dublin ferry route. Norbank is sitting in the huge dry dock at the Camel Laird shipyard. Just now, it's anything but dry. The water's gone, but the bottom of the dock is thick with Mersey mud. It's an unavoidable problem. Getting the silt back into the river where it belongs is Paul Bramwell. When they open the gates at the bottom, the mud rushes in. And now they have to wash it back out again using a bit of power, 
a bit of water and a lot of muscle. This is going to take you eight to ten hours. Every one of those hours is an hour when the hull isn't being cleaned. You do get full of mud, yes. <laughs> With the mud gone, the cleaning gear is craned in. Just a few hours ago, the dock was filled with 36 million gallons of water, so every bit of kit has to be dropped in over the side. Finally, the experts can get a look at the underwater ship. In 2007, the Norbank was given a revolutionary non-stick paint system that's supposed to make it hard for marine growth to stick to the hull. Technical manager Hans Pronk is keen to see how it's performing. You see it rinses off so easily. It's also, in the total budget cost, will reduce cleaning costs as well. So, uh, actually, it is a win-win situation uh, for us, this product. The high-tech paint is looking good. But the many seawater inlets around the ship could be a bigger problem. As you see, a lot of marine growth, like mussels, that's much, much, much harder to get off. Yeah, it is really tough, yeah? And if there's muscle sticks into a pump, you get damage to the pumps. The Norbank uses seawater for engine cooling, adjusting the balance of the ship and the fire safety system. The inlets are great places for mussels to breed. Seawater containing oxygen and food is delivered to their doorstep. So the mussels have to go. This is a real harder material eh, to remove. Hans isn't only worried about the mussels he can see. Baby mussels can get through filters and into the engine cooling system where they grow and block the pipes. There's nothing worse than a mussel in your pipes. But getting rid of them is a huge job. In Gloucester, the little house filled with an enormous pile of electronics, household junk and filth is about to get a visit from the clearance team. Danny and young James have a special connection. He's, he's my son. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. He's, got a, he's got a work to pay his housekeeping. <laughs> but Danny hasn't told the lads how bad this one's going to be. Well, no. How many days? A couple of days here, isn't it? Uh, unbelievable how they live. But by the end of the day, it's someone's father or someone's mother who lived here. I just can't believe they let their parents live like this. Some scientists think extreme hoarding like this is an illness, failure to control animal instincts to gather food and nest materials. But while hoarding nuts makes sense for a squirrel, for a human, it can lead to tragedy. It's a shame, yeah, it's a shame. But it gives us a job, so we don't mind. More jobs like this, the better. The amazing range of electronics surprises even the professionals. It's just junk. Junk worth, in its day, thousands of pounds, I would imagine. Thousands. James, you. if you take one of these, you can call me later. <laughs> oh. Is that not hard life you boys got, is it? We'll have to fill with Morris now, taking empty in the trash. Porno fields are you. <laughs> me and Mrs. got one of these in the bedroom. <laughs> I don't think she'll appreciate me saying that. Boy, it, tenor. Better than that thing you got on your shoulder now. <laughs> the team seems to be making progress. But then Danny opens up the garage. Oh my god. Bloody hell, man. Nightmare. Nightmare. As far as it go back. The three bedroom house clearance has just gone to another level. It goes on and on and on. Beyond the garage, Danny discovers a load of outbuildings. Oh, this is rammed full and all. Obviously built eight buildings on, which you can see, see there. And um, it looks like they're all full up as well. And that's not the end of it. Oh, my God. This is the utility room off the kitchen. Bits of computers, electrical stuff. 
There's another one here. I don't have a look in there. But this is going to be the worst we've, we've cleared, I think. It's not going to be two days here. It's going to be more like a week. Sixty miles away in Birmingham, a different sort of mess needs to be cleaned. Feral pigeons have been living in a public toilet for 20 years. Meet Dion and Hugo, boldly going where no human has been for far too long. Supersized problem. One tonne of disease carrying pigeon poo. Time to shift it. Two days. Oh dear. Fantastic. I think they cleaned them out of Mr. Few. Bits and pieces. It's a bit dirty. It wouldn't be my uh, choice of home. And I don't think the hand dryer has been used for a while. And as for the running water, I think that stopped a long time ago. It's quite quite thick and baked on there. It's maggots. Wonderful creatures. Yeah, a skeleton. And it's uh, obviously it's been dead some time. Right. Let's get this place spick and span. Already they've found dead and dying pigeons and a lot of maggots. It's easily the worst pigeon problem they've ever seen. Seeing it for the first time, kind of hits you in the face. As you get older and wiser, nothing kind of surprises you anymore. Talking of older and wiser. Have a go crowbar, but the next best thing, a weighty leg. Ah, oh, I got you. Nice full apartment, lovely one. That's the old toilet roll. Pity the pigeons couldn't use it. The worst dangers are invisible. Pigeon feces is nasty stuff, full of bugs, including salmonella, and carries diseases like pigeon fancier's lung. It can even cause blindness. And the poo's so acidic that it can strip paint and dissolve stonework. So you don't want to breathe it in. Dust particles are a hazard, but obviously if you wear the protective clothing, yeah, you're okay. The depth of guano in the toilet is a special problem. It might conceal dangers left behind by the human occupants. Now I've got to get in there, clean up the toilet bowl. Obviously, I don't need to put my hands in there because I never know. It could be sharps, it could be glass in there, anything you know, that could cause an injury, really. Hugo and Dion have got used to handling the worst kind of waste every day. But their families aren't as keen. What have you doing today, Daddy? I tried to explain, and the wife just says no. Don't want to know. You'd have thought the smell would be a bit of a giveaway. It stinks. I've only been doing it for three years, but I've enjoyed every th every part of it. I enjoy the challenge. The filthier, the better. Lovely stuff. There's nowhere, <laughs> nowhere free of guano anyway. After a day's scraping and digging, Dion and Hugo have removed over a ton of pigeon feces, the most they've ever seen. Shifting the bulk of the guano is just the first part of the job. The disease-ridden residue still poses a risk. Hugo and Dion will be back. Coming up, the disgusting secrets of the Gloucester house we might have had a wee in there, I think. And the clock's ticking for the Merseyside ship cleaners. That's more like a carpet up there. It's, like, thick. That's going to be hard out to come off. Size grind teams are about to reach the heart of the filth. Later, in the Gloucester hoarder's house, there's something stomach-churning in the kitchen. Ugh. And in London, the team tackling Strata's filthy windows are hoping it's safe to go up. But next, in Merseyside, the team at Camel Laird have to race against the clock to clean the huge, grime-encrusted hull of the Norbank. One of the men on the jet washer is Tom. He's not from round these parts. They take all the, uh, all the moss off and all the barnacles, so it's get ready for painting. You feel it there, you can see that it's slimy. It's just like a moss. You rub it like that, but this ship isn't too bad, to be honest with you. Once we start washing it, it should just come off. It's like a carpet. The main weapon in cleaning the hull is a high-performance pressure washer. 
it delivers £1,500 per square inch. Not the sort you'd use on your car. Oh, just uh, rip your car to bits, to be honest with you. Like, I reckon if you put it, it's that powerful, it would, it would probably cut into that, cut into the mud, into the wood. Dangerous things if you haven't been taught how to use it. Like, people will just think that it's just a basic, everyday job, like washing a car, but it's, as you can see, it's not, you know what I mean? The underwater hull is the biggest part of the job. The high-tech paint means the barnacles come off quickly. But on the waterline, it's a different story. Up there, it's like, it's like a thicker, thicker muscle that's going to be harder to come off than that is. That's just like a slime. That's more like a carpet up there. It's like thick. So that's probably going to be the worst part. The Norbank was launched in 1993 and is constantly assaulted by sea life on the eight-hour return trip between Liverpool and Dublin. Three starfish here. Eh? Just to fell out of one of the tanks at the bottom. There's all kinds of stuff in there, crabs and everything, fish, all kinds. As well as being rid of all unwelcome marine visitors, she'll be painted top to bottom and get a full service, all in eight days. If they get it right, she won't be back for at least two years. As Tom's keen to point out, not everyone could do this job. There's a more than just painters, you know what I mean? Remember, marine anti-corrosion technicians we are. Well, paint has basically. The marine slime isn't the only thing feeling the pressure. The cleaning team knows this job must be finished on time. Two days ago in South London, extreme winds forced the team to abandon their attempt to clean the 1,100 windows of the Strata building, central London's tallest residential tower. What's it like 500 feet up? It's much, much better today. It's a nice, bright day, no wind at all, so it's ideal weather conditions, really. Once again, Paul sets off over the building in what he calls the boat. Paul's hoping conditions will be a lot less choppy than last time. The uh, boom is going to telescope all the way out. Probably, I don't know what you'd say, maybe 80 foot, the length of the, this boom. Despite all the high-tech gear, Paul is from pure window cleaning stock. I've been doing this for about 28 years, and um, my, my, I got into it from my father, who uh, took over from his father. Yeah, so my, my father started, took over from his dad in 1935, and uh, our whole family's been involved in it ever since. Even on a calm day, this is not a place for the faint-hearted. Whoa! This is the very top of the building. So uh, all it leaves now is us to uh, slew round and go round to the other side. By adjusting the slewing arm, Paul lines the cradle up with the windows he's going to clean. What's holding us up here at the moment is um, we have a, a, a wire which uh, takes us up and down, and we have a safety wire that comes along with that. It looks skinny, but uh, they can take a, an enormous amount of stress. Accidents are very rare. Uh, but they do occur. Uh, last year there was, a, there was a fault with one of the cradles and uh, the window cleaners three fell three floors. Uh, lucky enough, they was higher in three floors. If they was working on the second floor or something and they fell three floors, obviously they're going to get seriously injured. But these guys work safely, so there's no need for danger money. Typically, you, you might get the same as someone who cleans a, window, a shop window on the street, and not much more. The journey to the summit of London's tallest block of flats is complete. Hello, Bill. Well, we're ready to start showing now, so whenever you're ready to start coming down the back stair, OK? At last, window cleaner Paul is suspended over 500 vertical feet of truly filthy windows. In Gloucester, the building's a lot smaller, but the scale of the grime is growing all the time. Danny and the crew are rapidly revising how much stuff they've got to clear. Each truck full is a ton and a half. Yeah, I can't get much more on there, so uh, I should go and dump this now. There'll be no early finish tonight. I just uh, look with more, as I say, when we go on a job, I say it only take 10 minutes. And he only pays 10 minutes. <laughs> In the kitchen, things are about to get a lot worse for Morris. The more you move it, the more it smells. That actually looks a bit, uh, 
to be human things, you know. I don't know what that is in there. Uh, it looks a bit like uh, we might have had a wee in there, I think. Try and clear the sink so we can get some uh, running water on clean later on. Oh, you wouldn't want to do the washing up in here, would you? Oh. That stinks. Oh. I think that could be a uh, human waste in there. Oh. I'll get it out now and then straight away after getting this out, I'll get rid of the gloves. The smell. Oh. Oh, I think this is the worst kitchen sink I've done. Until today, no one knew the former occupier lived like this. Oh. That was disgusting. Oh. I'll have to sit in the bath for about two hours tonight. After the stomach churning, stinking sink, how about a spot of lunch? Some, uh, not like Danny, I had some healthy beef, beef sandwiches, wholemeal bread, uh, not fish and chips. My missus to me eating this, she go mad. <laughs> Even for seasoned professionals, this job has been exceptional. Yeah, they've been working hard. Yeah. You're not having a bonus, so. <laughs> Three tons of rubbish have left the building, but it's hard to tell. We got rid of about two, two truckloads already today. We've only just scratched the surface, really, so this must carry on. Despite clearing tons of rubbish, the story of the Gloucester Hoarder House is not yet over. Back in South London, the windows of the spectacular Strata building are coated in grime. The man taking on this supersized problem is window cleaner Paul, currently working his way down to the top floor. You, you sort of fend yourself off so you don't clip the building too often. There's bumpers on the cradle so it won't do any damage, but um, you just want to avoid that if you can. As he reaches the first apartment on floor 43, Paul prepares his kit. This is called an applicator and this is called a squeegee. It would do a lot of damage if something like this fell down on someone's head from below. So we have to make sure that all our tools are tethered. What we'll do is try and catch the water so it stops the, um, stops the drips covering the whole of the building. Although the window cleaning's done the way it has been for years, other aspects of the job have changed beyond recognition. One of the major things, I suppose, is the, we use the safety harness in there. But the downside of that is that um, if you do happen to fall out of the cradle and you're suspended, um, there's, there's something called suspension trauma. And basically, all the straps would cut into your body. Um, your blood supply would stop. Um, you would pass out. And then you've got like something like 15 minutes after you first fall to get back on your feet. The result could be brain damage, blood poisoning, and eventually death. Window done, it's down to the next floor. Paul measures a building in drops, how many runs of the cradle from top to bottom it'll take to clean all the windows. The Strata building has 25 drops, each of an hour and a half. Cleaning all 1,100 windows will take two and a half weeks. Forty-five minutes later, and the drop's complete. Paul begins the long journey up to fill his bucket. It's not a windy day, but I just like to keep um, fending, fending the cradle away from the building. On a clear day, the best view in London is a spectacular perk of a satisfying job. Yeah, it's nice to see a building filthy dirty and you walk away and it's gleaming. It does give you a bit of sense, a bit of pride in your work, yeah. But these aren't the views we're interested in. Paul's a window cleaner. He must have some confessions. Yeah, I've seen some new people and uh, some people uh, 
getting up to things they shouldn't be. <laughs> Funniest thing I've seen is, um, is a type of cradle is, which is like a winch cradle and um, you've got to, like, kind of a, to, like, like a bicycle wheel I suppose and you, you sort of wind yourself up. By the time we got to the top, you know, we was, we was drenched in sweat and we were just about to start work and we looked through the, the window and there was a, a naked woman sitting, in, sitting on a chair and like um, we looked at her, she looked at us, she screamed and uh, she was telling us to go away when I'm thinking it took us three quarters of an hour to get up this high, we're drenched in sweat, can you go away, like let us get on with it. So that's what we did. At the end of the job, Paul's travelled 7.2 kilometres in the cradle, used 50 buckets of water and cleaned 4,500 square metres of glass. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for window cleaning kind. That's, uh, that's done for another three months, isn't it? Another three months, Yep. Coming up on our journey through supersized grime, will a giant ship, a public toilet, and a house filled with unbelievable quantities of filthy rubbish ever be clean again? Time is running out for the teams tackling Britain's supersized grime. Coming up, the P&O Ferry Norbank must leave dry dock cleaned and on time, or thousands of travellers will be disappointed. And the filthy Birmingham public toilet has to be made safe before the demolition crew can do their work. But first, it's back to the tiny house in Gloucester, where every room and several outbuildings were filled with tons of filthy rubbish. Having run out of time on their first visit, Morris, Danny and James are back. Today, they'll attempt a final clearance of the hoarded electronics and junk. Bit more room now. Breaking the back of it slowly. But there's plenty still to do. I know. They make the boys sweat. <laughs> With more room to work, Morris and James shift van load after van load of junk. Barnes Rugby Club Disco. Are you there, Dan? The unusual range of electronic, music and video gear still has Morris intrigued about who the man was who hoarded all this stuff. Everything was electronic, so he must have been some kind of electrical engineer. Very good one, I would think. Uh... Then James finds a box of reel-to-reel -reel tapes and an intriguing old case. I just imagine he's part of a band or something. There's all tickets from the JFK airport and things like that. I just imagine he was a uh, quite a pl quite a player. I just imagine he had a lot of guitars and things here. Some of the items date back to the 60s, but the boys are paid to junk them, not research them. <laughs> I've heard from the neighbours a very private man. Never let anybody in the house, but you can see why, so what can you do? You think, thank God my parents, you know, don't end up like this. And, uh... Although they spend their days sifting through other people's tragic lives and up to their knees in filth, you get the idea these boys actually enjoy the job. <laughs> Last little bit out here and off to the pub. There's no room for technology in a job like this. Every ton of junk has been shifted by hand. I used to be fat like Danny. Now I'm super slim. All paid for, mate. All paid for. They've said it before, but this time, the end really is in sight. It's always uh, nice to see the end job. It's been the team's most extreme clearance job ever. But finally, the rooms crammed with filthy waste are cleared. And what was the worst part of the job? No contest. Got to be the kitchen sink. You get used to it, you know, you know you got to do it, so um, get it done and, and that's it. Time for the reckoning. How much stuff have the boys shifted? It was about 20 tonne of, of waste. That's about a good, good 15 loads of rubbish from out there. Uh, 
At the pigeon-infested public toilet in Birmingham, Dion and Hugo are making sure the ex-residents can't move back in. For the next phase of their attack, they brought along a quarter of a tonne of water. Just filling up the buckets now for the water and uh, obviously give it a good scrub down. Lovely, it comes off like a piece of cake. Not that I'd like to try it. Obviously it's coming off quite well and uh, back to the old surface. Pigeon droppings are a worldwide problem. The Kings of Leon had to abandon a concert in St. Louis after pigeons pooed on several band members. And in 2007, a man died when an awning collapsed, weighed down by pigeon nests and excrement. I'd like to get in there, get dirty, get the job done, and see the satisfaction on the customer's, uh, customer's face. They'd almost eat your dinner off this now. Dion and Hugo have removed a tonne and a half of pigeon guano, making this the worst pigeon problem they've ever seen. In just two days, they've removed every sign that the pigeons were ever there. As you can see, the finished product. All cleared out, ready for the contractors. It's definitely cleaner than it was. OK, then, Hugo, time to pack up. Another job well done. You said it, brother. It's been a disgusting and hazardous job, but these two take it in their stride. I'm just looking forward to a nice shower. I absolutely stink. On to the next. Messier the better. Back in Liverpool, it's the final day in dry dock for MV Norbank, the P&O ferry having a super-sized wash and brush up. She's looking a lot smarter than when she docked eight days ago. But she's not quite finished. Although most of the paint will last another two years, some damaged sections must be replaced. But they ran into a problem. Here's ship manager Tony Scaife. Uh, we're just putting the finishing touches to the anti-fouling paint on the hull here. We were short of paint this morning, a couple of jumps short. Uh, that's now arrived in the yard, and so we're applying that. Uh, we should be finished today, and we'll be clear of the dock then. It's not just the hull that needs cleaning. Even the giant ship's propellers get crusted in marine growth. We bring a, uh, a specialist subcontractor, and they specialise in polishing the propellers. So on the main propellers, they get a, a good fuel saving as well. If the propellers are working properly, everything's clean, they get a, they get a fuel saving. Because they've been worked on, the propellers need to be dry tested before the ship's allowed back in the water. To help the Norbank manoeuvre, the huge blades can swivel to generate reverse thrust. They seem to be moving fine. It's been a huge job. Working on these ships is a massive job. We've got the paint uh, just for, the, for this paint job this time around. It's, it's only a touch-up job, but uh, we've used up to 1,700 litres of paint this time. With the dock due to be flooded, ship manager Tony Scaife and technical manager Hans Pronk are checking that everything will be ready and likely to pass the final inspection. OK, Hans, so the, uh, the cleaning of the hull's gone quite well. Uh, we've prepped all the mechanical damage to the paint and we've touched up where we need to. That should buy us another two years, ready for your next dry docking. Yes, yes. During this two-week dry docking, we've uh, done the cleaning and the painting of really much, pretty much the, uh, the whole ship. That's uh, the underwater area, the blue sides that you can see, and also the white top sides. The MV Norbank is fit for another two years' hard work in the Irish Sea. One super-sized ship has been cleaned of grime. Next time on Super Size Grime, the Olympic-sized pool of human poo. It's a close encounter of the third coin, I suppose, isn't it? A chilling tale from grime-encrusted streets. Leaves me speechless. And how do you clean up a nuclear power station? We've got rid of 27,000 so far, and so uh, 27,000 to go.